morning, everybody. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Hernando County. And I see Teresa on here also. Uh, and welcome to our hectic Thursday morning uh, virtual plant clinic. I know that all of us have been really busy. Uh, I was involved in a um, hydroponics Zoom class yesterday afternoon with about 100 people on it. And we have to do part two a little bit later on today. So um, let me go and turn off a camera there. So things have been busy, but we did want to get together today in case anybody has any questions. And Teresa did share a few pictures with me of things that people have sent in to her. So we'll go over those in a minute. Well, let me go ahead and attempt to share my screen here and go over just a couple things here really quick. With today's updates. So one thing I did want to mention, and Lily said that she did cover this last week when I wasn't able to be with all of you. And this applies to just her in county. So for anybody watching or listening, from another county, your restrictions are gonna be different. But here in Hernando County, for lawn irrigation, we are under once a week watering restrictions. Now this counts for if you have an irrigation system that waters your entire lawn. If you go out there with a watering can or a garden hose and you're watering your palm tree, your flower garden or your vegetable garden, this does not apply. This does just apply for um, your irrigation system that covers your entire lawn. But if you don't know what day you're supposed to water, this handy little chart here will tell you that. So our address ends in a five. So my day to be able to water is gonna be on a Wednesday. So obviously whatever the last number in your address is, that's how they determine what day of the week you're allowed to water. Now you're allowed to water either before 8 a.m or after 6 p.m., but not both, because that right. would be watering twice in one day. So on my day, Wednesday, I can water either very, very early, making sure that everything is done and off by 8 a.m., or I could water later in the day after 6 p.m. Obviously, you don't want to water your yard in the middle of the day, because it's when it's a nice, warm, sunny day out, a lot of the water is going to evaporate before it hits the ground and it's just not nearly as efficient. So that's the idea behind the once a week watering restrictions. So if you are do you, have- Are you hearing music, system, Bill? Bill? Pardon me? Are you, yes, ma'am? Are you hearing music? Bernie is hearing things. He's hearing music. Do you hear any music? No, I don't hear any music. Neither that do might I. Be Bernie playing music in his background. Uh, yeah. Everybody's microphone is off. And okay. everything is actually quiet here at the moment. Yeah, no, no music dogs. here. I think um, either Bernie or Stu must be singing because um, <laughs> we don't hear any music. <laughs> That could be it. You know, we could have Bernie chime in and sing for us a little bit later on if he wants. Um, <laughs> might as well get a little creative with this. I mean, this is your time to ask questions so or sing. So I, I never really thought about adding a talent component to it, but we could look into that. So, But if you do have an irrigation system and you find that you're spending a lot of money on water, let's say you're with Hernando County Utilities like I am, Two very easy ways for you to save water and save money on your irrigation is number one, calibrate your system. Go out there and run your system during the day. And I just got done saying that you're not allowed to irrigate during the day. You are allowed to go out there and test your system and turn your system on and run through it zone by zone and walk around your yard and check your sprinkler heads, make sure you don't have any broken heads, make sure they're pointed in the right direction. A lot of times these heads will get bumped and knocked out of calibration. So now instead of watering your yard, they're watering your car, your driveway, your sidewalk, the street, 
So you can go ahead and be aware of that and fix the heads so they're pointing in the right direction. And you always want to have a functioning rain shutoff device. And if you're thinking, what is that? Well, first of all, here is a sprinkler head and here's somebody, a nice up close shot here, somebody who injured his finger, I think, calibrating their uh, sprinkler head. And if you're wondering what a rain shutoff device is, it's this funny looking little thing that's probably attached to the side of your house somewhere. And what happens is when it rains, the little, the little box, little contraption on the end there gets wet and it automatically shuts off your system. This is why hopefully if it's pouring rain and your system tries to go on as scheduled, it won't. This is the thing that turns off your system when either it's raining or it just got done raining. The problem is this little um, contraption here, they're pretty inexpensive. Um, I think $20, maybe more at a big box store or irrigation supply store or online. You can get everything from Amazon now. The problem is they're only good for maybe one or two years. They don't last very long and they're definitely not gonna last 20 or 30 years. So if you have a rain shut off device that came with the house and you've lived in your house for a number of years, chances are it doesn't work anymore and you wanna get that looked at. Now I know Hernando County Utilities has a special program where they will uh, give you a rebate on your water bill if you get one of these replaced. And next week, I'm gonna have Lily bring in some more information about that and a link. Okay. So if we have anybody who's interested in maybe looking into that, if you're on Hernando County Utilities, now if you're on a well, this wouldn't apply to you. And if you also, live in another county, this does not apply to you. But for Hernando County Utilities customers, this does. Yes, ma'am. Also, you have to utilize one of our participating irrigation contractors. So I'll bring that information to you next week. DIY projects do not qualify for this. And exactly. it would come, yeah, it would come as a credit on your water bill. And I do know that at least one of the irrigation contractors will come in and replace your non-functioning rain sensor for $50 and that is the credit that you get. So, um, you know, it's a wash for you. Okay, well, there's obviously uh, certain restrictions and rules that go along with it. So, mm -hmm. so next week, that'll be one of our uh, tips for the weekend is replacing your rain shut off device and if you're a Hernando County Utilities customer, how to go about doing that and being able to save a little bit of money in the process. So I want to mention next Tuesday, April 28th at 10 a.m., we are going to have an online class. This is going to be through Zoom and also through our Facebook Live. So I got a question on Facebook just this morning about this class. And a lady said she wishes that it wasn't on Zoom. Not everybody likes Zoom. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult to log on. I had a few problems this morning myself. So what we're trying to do is offer a lot of our classes through Zoom and also through Facebook Live. So this one is gonna be on both and it's caring for your spring vegetable garden because I know now a lot of people have their spring garden in the plants are all planted, the seeds are in, hopefully everything is coming up and looking good. And certain problems can come up. You can have insect problems, you can have diseases. Right now, we have problems with it's very, very dry. So you're gonna to have to be out there making sure that your garden is well watered. You're gonna be having to take care of that. When we do start to get those afternoon rains and the humidity goes up, we're gonna have a lot more plant disease problems. So we're gonna cover all that. And nice thing about doing it on Zoom and on Facebook Live also is people are able to ask questions at the very end. And I've noticed so far from the classes that we've done, people will come on with a lot of questions, which is really great. So definitely um, keep your questions coming. We'll go ahead and get rid of that. And let's see if we have any questions here. Um, okay. we. People mention that they don't hear any music. So I think it's uh, uh, the group agrees that none of us hears music except for Bernie. So hopefully that's not a problem for anybody else. Um, 
Let's see. Let's. Um... There aren't any plant questions yet. Okay, if you guys have any general plant questions, if you want to go ahead and ask them and let me go ahead and try to pull up some pictures here that Teresa shared with me. Here we go. Teresa sent these to me. Lily, can you see this picture of a magnolia? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. You can see the picture of the magnolia leaf. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure who sent this to Teresa, but somebody did send it to the office. Um, and this is a magnolia tree. This is obviously a uh, pretty, let's move up to the exact picture here. This is a fairly small, newly planted magnolia tree, which seems to be doing pretty well. I can see some flowers on it. Um, it doesn't look perfect, but it doesn't look terrible. I've seen worse. <laughs> but this does have a few problems with spots on the leaves. And I know that magnolia trees can get a disease. It, believe it or not, it's not a fungus. It's actually an algae. It's parasitic algae. But this honestly does not look exactly like it. It would look a little bit different. So this magnolia tree does look like it has a fungal problem. Dark staining or dark patches on a leaf might indicate that you have an insect problem also because we have certain insects, certain species of scales, white flies, uh, mealybugs, that when they feed on a plant, they excrete or poop all over it and you get a fungus that grows in their poop. And the first hint that you have a problem is you're gonna see black on the leaves. And if you take your finger, you can kind of rub it off. So this might possibly be it, but honestly, from some of these pictures, I don't see really clear evidence of an insect. And looking at the top of the leaf, there are some black spots there. So I'm guessing that this is a fungal problem. You may want to spray um, a fungicide on the tree. Liquid copper would work very well for that. There's a product that's called Daconil, D-A-C-O-N-I-L. That's the trade name. It's a form of chlorothalonil, which is also a very good fungicide. So either one of them would work well. But overall, the tree doesn't really look all that bad. Um, it's obviously still young. Magnolia trees do lose their leaves bit by bit throughout the entire year. So don't be too alarmed if you have a magnolia that you see uh, a couple leaves turning yellow and falling off. That's normal. Excessive leaf drop obviously indicates some kind of problem. Uh, if it has a root issue, unfortunately, the tree may one day drop all of its leaves. That's a very bad situation. Not a whole lot you can do about that. But a funny thing about magnolias is if you look very closely at them, you can almost always find scale insects, other insects feeding them, on them, a little bit of disease. But magnolias, if they're otherwise healthy and happy and doing well, can grow through insects and diseases and all kinds of other problems. Don't think that your magnolia has to be 100% pest and disease free because it's probably not going to happen. So overall, this one looks not too terrible. So Teresa, hopefully that kind of answered the question. I didn't get the contact information for whoever sent this to you, but hopefully that will help answer the question. Let's go back through some of the um, chat here. Uh, Rick says, Zoom is easier for me, but anything virtual means I can attend these daytime sessions. That's great. Rick, we're more than happy to come to you during the day. We still do have one evening class per month because we really want to be able to offer something to people who have to work during the day. But what we've been doing with these um, virtual plant clinics, and I guess I'm going to do it with today's episode also, is we're able to save this as a video and put it back on Facebook. So for anybody who is not able to attend one of our clinics, but you still want to catch it, 
and see what kind of pictures we showed and what kind of questions we answered, you're able to do that. Um, from the opening this morning, I'm not positive if I really want to record this one, but we will. We'll turn <laughs> this into a video and we'll make it available. Uh, Jen asked, how can I sign up for the class on 428? I don't see it on Facebook. Lily, which class is that? Or Teresa, uh -huh. um, does anybody have our Facebook open? Um, is that the one that I mentioned? The vegetable gardening? Let me check. Okay, because for right now, if it's a Zoom class, all yes. you have to do is click on that Zoom link that we have on there at the appointed time, and boom, you're right there. If you don't yes, want to use Yes, it's Zoom, under your events. It's under your events and my events um, on Facebook. If you go to events, you'll see it. Pops right up, Spring Vegetable Garden with a big blue circle. Join us live on Zoom. So... Okay, so Jen, if you go to our Facebook page or Lily's Facebook and you find the event, it does have the Zoom link right there, so you can click on it. And if you go in at the right time, boom, you're there. If right you now, all of our classes front, are free and they're open for, the, for everybody. If you don't see it on the front page, try going to the events uh, portion. And you'll see all of our events and all your events. <laughs> You have a little bit more than I do because I don't have every one of yours shared that, like that Jim Davis teaches or things like that. So you'll, you'll find more events on the extension Facebook page than on the FFL page. Exactly, because some of the other people in our office, our county extension director, Jim Davis, has a whole series of classes he's doing on a lot of Florida wildlife. I believe his next one is on the American alligator, which I am well, not an alligator expert on. <laughs> I'll see what his next one is. Okay, he has a whole string of them coming up. Our um, C Grant agent, Brittany, or our marine biologist, has a whole series of classes coming up. She has a lot of children's classes, a whole series of them. Uh, she has master naturalist classes coming up. So I really recommend going to our Facebook page and looking through all the different things we have coming up. It's hard enough for me to keep on top of what I have scheduled, let alone what they have scheduled. So go on there. If you click on events, you're going to see a whole string of all the different things that we have planned and exactly how to sign up or how to just click on the link at the right time and join right in. Yes, tomorrow at 1. Uh, Jim Davis will be teaching on the American alligator. You are correct. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew that I hadn't missed the alligator one yet. <laughs> so if you want to learn everything you want to know about alligators, tune in and everybody make sure that you go on for that and think up a really hard question to ask him about alligators. So he likes the hard questions. I think when social distancing is over, Everyone should be able to get a graduate degree in some kind of natural resources <laughs> with all of the classes that we're offering. Well, I know by the time we're done, you and I should qualify for some kind of Zoom certification, <laughs> Facebook Live and everything else. So, okay, we got a question here. What are the best conditions to plant a hibiscus tree that is currently potted in my garden? Sun, moisture, soil, fertilizing, Okay, hibiscus likes, it prefers and tolerates full sun. It'll take a little bit of shade. The shadier the spot is, the leggier it gets in the long term. So sunnier makes it grow more compact and less leggy. Shadier is going to make it grow leggier, but they can grow and do well in both spots. Um, moisture. Hibiscus is really, really fussy when it comes to moisture. It needs to be watered on a regular basis, but not overwatered. Because hibiscus, if it gets too dry, it'll drop its buds and it won't flower. If it's too wet, it drops its buds and it won't flower. It gets really kind of fussy on both ends. So as a general rule, when we get regular rains here, you don't have to irrigate it on top of that. But if you have... <clears throat> have a hibiscus is in a spot where it's also getting irrigation and you're watering once a week, like we already talked about, and it's raining two or three times a week on top of that, 
maybe you have kind of a heavy soil. If it gets too wet, what's going to happen is the leaves are going to start to turn yellow and drop off on a regular basis. And if it does have flower buds on it, the buds are probably going to drop off before they have a chance to open a flower. Soil, hibiscus does fine in our native sandy soils. You probably want to amend it with some kind of compost or organic matter to help build the soil up a little bit. So a hibiscus over time, when it gets large, its roots are gonna go a ways out. So if you plant it and you put just a little bit of, let's say compost, black cow, cow manure, both of those work well. If you put only a little bit right in the planting hole, the roots are gonna spread well beyond it anyway. So put a lot in and prepare a nice big planting hole that's well amended with compost or black cow, cow manure and that's gonna make it grow better. Fertilizing, um, hibiscus isn't a really heavy feeder. I have one out front and goodness knows, I never ever get around to watering it or fertilizing it. And other than the fact it needs to be pruned back badly, I'm gonna shoot a little video on that when I do it so that you can look forward to seeing just how bad my hibiscus looks out front right now and how good it's gonna look by the time I get done with it. Um, so fertilizing isn't really critical, uh, light fertilizing with any kind of all purpose lawn and garden fertilizer, uh, 666, 101010 10, 10 works fine. You probably want to fertilize it lightly in the spring. Like right now, you know, a few weeks ago would have been a little bit better, but right now it's fine to get it going in the spring and summer and get it growing. A hibiscus takes time to grow and then set those flower buds on it. So if you have a hibiscus, you really want to try your best to trim it once, maybe twice a year. If you go out there and every month kind of trim, trim, trim to keep it at the exact perfect size that you want, it's almost never going to flower because every time you're trimming the ends of the branches, you're taking off the buds that it's trying to form. So the hibiscus is trying to form flowers. You're always trimming them off. So the best thing to do is trim it really well and low once a year and then give it enough room to just kind of go on its own for the year. Eventually, it takes a few months, but eventually it's going to start to flower and look really good. Um, I okay, would here. suggest, okay. Bill. Okay, yes, Lily, anything else? My, my personal history with anything in the uh -huh. hibiscus family here in the Royal Highlands, make sure it's a decent size before you put it out in the yard. You know, it has lots of leaves and maybe three or so feet tall. Your liner plants, my bunnies just eat them. That's that's all that happens if I try to put tiny hibiscus out in the yard already. So don't put them out until they're a decent size and can withstand being eaten by the rabbits. So. I didn't even think of that. Uh, yeah, I didn't think to mention rabbits, uh, deer. Wow, for anybody listening who lives in an area where you have a deer problem, deer like to eat darn near everything and deer will eat up a hibiscus, uh, and there's lots of lots of other things in your yard that they'll eat. Other than chasing the deer away or getting a couple of huskies to keep the deer away, <laughs> they're always going to be a problem. So you're going to have to use fencing, uh, try to fence them out of your property. So yeah, no, that's a good point to make sure that it, if you do have a rabbit problem, make sure it's a fairly decent sized plant before you put it in the ground. And then of course, after you transplant it, you need to physically go out there and water it at least once a day, maybe twice a day for starters, because it's gonna dry out very quickly until we start to get some regular daily rains here. So Carol asks, any tips to coax a bird of paradise to bloom? When we lived over in Deltona, which is pretty much straight across the state from here, I had a bird of paradise and it rarely bloomed they can be, it is, it's more of a tropical plant. We are not so far north that you can't have them. They're always going to suffer a little bit of freeze damage, a lot like a hibiscus or firebush. They're going to freeze back a little bit every winter. So every spring, you're going to have to prune them up and clean them up, get rid of that dead frozen foliage left over from that cold night in February. Um, Bird of Paradise uh, generally 
that cold does not, they kind of like that. That is going to be part of what triggers them to flower. But I think a bird of paradise needs a good amount of time of warm weather to grow and spread, set those flower buds and flower. So with the bird of paradise, other than just uh, good basic care, making sure it gets watered on a regular basis, uh, regular fertilizing in the spring, maybe once again in the summer, that's about all you could do to kind of get a bird of paradise to bloom. They can be fussy because we are, you know, here in Hernando County, a little bit out of their natural range. If we all live down in Miami, you could put them in your front yard. It grows like a weed. It's going to flower a lot. So I think it's a, um, a part of that cold damage every year, knocking them back a little bit and not having enough time to grow and grow and grow and then flower. So Lily, any ideas? Other than um, Master Gardener Wynn seems to have a lot in his yard, um, but he lives pretty far east in the county. So he's got a pretty heavy type, you know, clay-like soil. And um, he's kind of, most of his yard is partial shade. So maybe that is the conditions that they like too. I know they could do very well in full sun out in the middle of your front yard. Wind's yard probably, I know, stays a little bit warmer because he has a lot of really heavy tree cover. Yeah. So if your yard is underneath a lot of big oak trees, it always stays a little bit warmer on those really cold nights because that the oak trees are kind of creating a little bit of a blanket effect. And if you go in your backyard, it's a little bit warmer than my backyard or maybe Lily's front yard where there isn't a lot of tree cover. So other than trying to keep your bird of paradise a little bit warmer in the winter, if that is physically possible, if you're able to cover it on cold nights, that is probably going to help it to um, not get knocked back from the cold in the winter and will probably help with the flowering long term. So Rick asks, we moved here from Missouri. Well, welcome, Rick. So I'm having trouble knowing what grows uh, when here for veggies. I'd just be starting to plant the garden up there. Is there anything that does well through the heat of summer here? Peppers maybe, Mediterranean herbs, anything else? Rick, if you're interested about growing herbs and you go on our Facebook page and you scroll back a little bit, we do have uh, a class that I did on herbs about what herbs do well here. And that does cover Mediterranean herbs, uh, they do grow very, very well here in Central Florida. They're always going to suffer a little bit for a few months during the summer, during the heat of summer, mostly because of the humidity and the heat. Not so much the heat, but the humidity, because over in the Mediterranean, it's not nearly as humid and steamy during the summer as it is here. So go on our Facebook page, scroll back a little bit, or look under videos, and that entire class is there on Facebook. Uh, we do have a University of Florida handout for vegetable gardening, which has a very good list. I know that every month, Teresa is very good on our Facebook page about posting um, uh, a little graphic about what vegetables you can grow that time of year. Because for everybody who moves here from another state, timing is totally different here in Florida. So if you try to grow following the same schedule you did in Missouri, things are not going to work out well here. For a few months during the heat of summer, during June, July, and August, the only things that do really well are okra and black-eyed peas. Hot peppers can survive the summer. For a few months, they might flower, but they're really not going to set any peppers because it's too hot. When the temperature uh, during the day is consistently well above 90, It'll make flowers, but the pollen is sterile, so the, uh, the flowers won't make little tiny pepper fruits. But if you can keep your peppers alive during the summer when it starts to cool off a little bit in, let's say, August and September, they're going to flower like crazy, and you should get another great big flush and crop of peppers then. So that's kind of an advantage to having peppers over the summer. You don't get a whole lot of peppers during the summer. You might get a few but you're gonna get a big batch of them when it cools off just a tiny bit in the fall. So Rick, um, I'm gonna ask Teresa, if Teresa's still on here, Teresa, are you here? Yeah, I see Teresa on here. Teresa, if you could pull up a link to the um, University of Florida Vegetable Gardening 
publication. That is a really, really good handout. So if Teresa can pull up that link for you, or you can just call our office and ask Teresa. The phone number is 352-754-4433. And Teresa is still there to answer calls. It has a really good list of all the vegetables you can grow here in Central Florida and exactly when to grow them. So that's going to be a really, really good guide for anybody wanting to grow vegetables here and to get an idea of the exact timing when to grow them because we are zone nine and obviously Missouri zone 5B, you are on a totally different time scale there. She just put the link on, on the chat there for the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. Okay, see, Teresa is really good that way. Thank you, yes. Teresa. Uh, Jen said she doesn't see it on Facebook. So Jen, if you call Teresa, once again, 352-754-4433, she can get you uh, a link or email you a link or information on um, being able to join one of our future classes. Uh, Teresa said now that you have your spring cross planted, what could possibly go wrong with them? I'm going to try to cover all of that on Tuesday or as much as I can. Uh, free class on Zoom. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the most common insect pests that are going to pop up, the most common disease problems that you're going to encounter. Diseases are really tough to cure once you get them on your vegetables. And we really don't talk a lot from a perspective of you're gonna go out there and cure your problem, the best thing to do is try to avoid the problem. And I'll give a whole bunch of tips and tricks about how to avoid disease problems, or if nothing else, you don't wanna make them worse. Uh, and then of course, we'll have questions and answers at the very end of that. That class, I will do my very best to have it on both Zoom and Facebook Live. So if you're unable to get to join through one of those, you'll be able to join through the other one. And Teresa does have a link there. So thank you, Teresa. Nikki says, my hibiscus gets aphids. Yes, aphids love hibiscus. They always go on the growing tips. So that very growing tip of the branches or when you get a flower bud and the flower bud is really tiny, aphids will get all over it and cover it. What happens is the aphids will poke into that bud and feed on it and damage it. And then a lot of times that flower bud's gonna fall off before it gets a chance to mature and open up for you. So um, aphids are very easy to control. All you need is a brand of insecticidal soap. And you can get that either online or at a lawn and garden center or a big box store. One very common brand name of that is Safer Soap, S-A-F-E-R Soap, and that's just the brand name. But if you can find any kind of insecticidal soap and spray that and just keep a very, very close eye on your hibiscus and spray it when you see aphids, you might have to spray it weekly. You're probably going to have to do it more than once to get them all. That's going to be a really good control for aphids. And a number of other small insects that you might get on a hibiscus. I know very common to see scales on a hibiscus. My hibiscus has gotten them before. Uh, mealybugs, you'll see a lot on hibiscus. So a lot of times insecticidal soap is really the strongest and best control you're gonna need. I see that uh, her hibiscus is already in bloom. Mine is also. Will it be okay to transplant now? Sure, you can go ahead and transplant it even though it is blooming. If it gets transplant shock, what might happen is it may drop those initial flowers right after you transplant it. But if you take good care of it and it grows some more, it's going to make some more flower buds. So Teresa's point, posting more links on there. Thank you very much, Teresa. I see the link to the EDIS document for the vegetable gardening uh, publication. That is like the Bible here for vegetable gardening information. In that one publication, it has a very good um, chart that tells you what you can grow here. And if you just follow the column for Central Florida, because Hernando County is in Central Florida, kind of the northern side of Central Florida, but still Central Florida, and you follow those planting dates, that's going to put you in the right ballpark for planting things at the correct time here. And a lot of people are amazed if they move here from other um, states about, you know, because I 
was born and raised and moved here from Maryland. And I remember my parents, we grew tomatoes and peppers every year. And you put them in the ground in May because May was spring up there. That's when it gets warm. People put their little tomato and pepper transplants in the ground. If you put them in in May here, you've really missed the boat. Here you're putting them in the ground like the end of February. And up there, you still have snow on the ground at the end of February. So things are very, very different here. The nice thing about Florida is you can grow pretty much year round. And for anybody who's interested in growing vegetables, your best vegetable garden season is during the winter, really from about September through March. There's a lot of different things that you can grow. You can't grow everything because we do get some cold weather, but right off the top of my head, anything green and leafy, different kinds of healthy, good for your greens, mustard greens, collard greens, dandelion greens, lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, carrots, beets, radishes, all those grow really, really well here in the winter. And people who move here from up north might think like, oh gosh, I never grew anything in the winter up there. It snowed all winter up there. I can't grow anything outside. You really kind of need to get on the Central Florida boat here and start getting your uh, vegetable garden really going during the winter because that's when you're going to get the most actual food that you can freeze and dry and process and juice or however else you want to consume it. Oh, okay, Rick, you grew up in Bowie, Maryland. I grew up in Silver Spring, so that's not too far from each other. I've been in Central Florida for many, many, many years. I haven't been up to Maryland for a long time. I think at this point, the cold would probably kill me in the winter. I'm just so much not used to it and acclimated to uh, Florida here. I know Lily's from Pittsburgh area and she likes to go up there during the winter. Ooh, not me. I have not grandchildren me. up there. I don't have a choice. Well, you need to plan it so their birthdays fall in the spring and fall, so at least you can go up there a nice time of year. So, Nikki also asked, thank you so much for responding regarding the aphids. You do an awesome job of responding to every comment question. I try to. Uh, Zoom is really, really easy to scroll through the comments here. And as long as you guys just stick with the, um, uh, the chat box at the bottom, it makes it really easy for me to read them and see them. And obviously it makes it really easy when I have all my helpers on here, my uh, co-host Lily, thanks Lily, and our uh, kind of anonymous co-host uh, Teresa, who is an invaluable help with going on there really quick and getting all those links up there for us. It seems to work really, really well. She's so I don't miss a beat. I try my best not to. Sometimes things get a little hectic and like I say, we're still learning the technology, but I'm doing my best. Thank you very much. Teresa's extension mom. She fixes everything. She is. Teresa is truly a blessing. So, <laughs> so and Teresa also posted on there, um, University of Florida makes a very nice infographic for every month of the year, and we post them on our Facebook page at the beginning of every month. And there's some of our um, most popular posts I think a lot of people click on them. They make an infographic for all the different vegetables that you want to grow that month. So uh, Teresa should be posting the ones for May really soon. It is just about May here. They make another one for herbs, what to do in your herb garden that month. She makes another, or they make another one for beekeeping. So for anybody who uh, has bees or interested in bees, it's the things to do that month if you're raising bees. And I think they have one or two other ones that they create and we try to post every month. So kind of, um, it's really handy because if you're wondering what do I do this month in Florida in my herb garden, my vegetable garden, it's all right there to kind of give you the basics and get you started. Great, I'm so glad to read and hear that everybody is learning so much in these plant clinics. We're just gonna have to promote it even harder and get even more people on here to ask even more questions. I see Dr. Carol Ren. figured out the, the little thumbs up thing. So see, we're all learning as we go here. So Tell Lily, do you have uh, anything else? Not, not that I can think of other than um, go to our Facebook pages, especially go to the events. 
um, because we have so many, we can keep you busy every day of the week. And um, I'm even posting uh, classes going on in other counties that look interesting. They have Pasco or Orange or Polk or Pinellas County has something that's kind of general information that would pertain to us as well. I also share that information. So um, I think it's really neat <clears throat> that people in Florida friendly landscaping and people in extension, what we do is we teach. So this, this new life has kind of knocked everyone for a loop, but all the, everyone stepped up and said, well, I teach, I'm gonna keep teaching and I'm gonna do it online. And we're actually, I think, reaching a broader audience. So in some way or another, this online presence is going to continue even when we get back to person, you know, face to face as well. Exactly, I totally agree because I mentioned earlier, I'm involved with a couple other people with extension and we put together a home hydroponics online course yesterday and part two of it is today. We had people from pretty much around the country, I believe we had almost a hundred people on Zoom. We also had it on Facebook Live. So if anybody wants to catch that, this afternoon, it's going to be at one o'clock this afternoon. If you go to our Facebook page, you can catch it on Facebook Live. And if you go to our Facebook page and go under events, you can click on the Zoom link. We do require advanced uh, registration for that, but it's as simple as putting in your name and email and Zoom immediately sends you an email with the link. So it only takes maybe a minute to get registered and get logged on for that class. This is great. It gives us a chance to really extend our reach. I really like the fact that we're able to do more classes in the evening and save these kind of um, plant clinics and classes for people who have to work during the day, people who might be busy at this time or that time. We always got comments and inquiries on Facebook in the past. Could you start saving these presentations so I could watch it when I have the time? Mm -hmm. or can you start doing more things in the evening? So I think it's really great that we're able to be more receptive to people and give really correct Central Florida based information because I'm a member of a lot of different Facebook gardening groups. And if you go on there and you start reading people's questions, the exact same kind of questions that I see in the chat box right here, if you were to put those questions on some of those Facebook groups, you get a lot of answers. You get different you get a lot of advice. Here, right. It'd be all over the place. And most of it wouldn't be correct. It wouldn't work. Some of it occasionally is dangerous. I've seen people recommend the use of mothballs and a lot of other things that are just really dangerous and not safe and ineffective. So we recommend safe and effective solutions to whatever your problem might be. And if we don't know what the question is, I got my pad of paper right here and I can write it down and I'll figure it out and we'll be back next week with the correct answer for it. So, so if you have questions, come on here and ask them, go to Facebook for amusement, but don't go there for, to get your serious questions answered. Might not, you might not be getting the best advice always. Um, and you and I are working on a project that we only just got the event up on Facebook. Um, a kids project. You want to tell them about that? The May 8th class. Yes. <laughs> um, we do have something coming up on May 8th. It's going to be on Zoom and it's going to be geared primarily for homeschool children. <laughs> here, hold on a second. Let me, let me kick my dog out of the room here. <laughs> well, what he was saying <laughs> is that um, it's for kids don't have to be homeschooled, any kids or anybody who's a kid at heart. Go ahead, <laughs> you can finish. Okay, thank you, I'm back. Um, <laughs> yes, it's primarily, it was designed or we got the idea for children because you know obviously all children are home right now and going through homeschooling. We do work a lot with local homeschool kids that we create teaching materials for and what we did in the past was they were in person, but obviously now they have to be online. But adults are welcome also. It's basically um, for anybody who's interested in insects and might be interested in getting into entomology or becoming an entomologist. 
So Lily and I will be there and we'll speak briefly, but I have um, uh, a friend of ours that we work with sometimes, her name is Ploy, and she graduated from University of Florida, gosh, maybe a year or so ago from the Dr. Plant Medicine Program. And she works with entomology and plant pathology in a lot of other areas. She works currently for a rose grower up in the Boston area. So she's gonna be on online sharing with the kids about how much fun it is working with insects and what you have to go through to become an entomologist and be able to uh, um, actually earn a living doing that. And we have another um, friend of mine, Matt Borden, who's gonna speak, who's still currently going to University of Florida. He's finishing the Doctor of Plant Medicine program, but he just recently finished his master's degree in um, urban entomology. So he can talk also about what it's like to go to school and work with insects and all the different opportunities for that. Because some people might think, oh, well, if I want to get a job as an entomologist, that means either I have to work for a pest control company or I have to be a researcher at University of Florida. No, there's a lot of different opportunities and a lot of different things that you could do with a degree for that. So we're, we're putting that class together and that's going to be on May 8th. Registration for that is free and it, that's also on our Facebook page. So if you're interested, go ahead and click on that and sign up for that. And our, our little bit of our hidden agenda, um, you kind of touched on that Floyd will be there and I'm going to read a story which, so I don't get in trouble, I'm going to write the story um, about the girl who loved bugs and what we're kind of our hidden agenda. We want it for everyone, but we want girls to know that uh, they can be entomologists too. It's kind of what we're aiming at. Yeah, that was one of the other goals for it. And I have, um, I gave a presentation to a national gardening group uh, youth class before. And I know from personal experience because Obviously with extension, I work for University of Florida and I work very closely with a lot of the researchers up, up there in the entomology department and a lot of other departments. And it's amazing with the researchers at the entomology department at UF and they were just recently ranked number one in the United States, the number one university to get an entomology degree from. I would say over 50% of the researchers who work there are female. So there's, don't think that, you know, there's not opportunities if you're a young lady, you're thinking of getting into entomology. There's a lot of opportunities in that. You just have to start young, taking the right kind of classes and being involved in the right kind of extracurricular things. And I, and you know, for anybody who has any questions about that, the two speakers that we're gonna have would be an excellent resource to ask because they've been there done that and are both very, very smart and very successful in entomology and other areas. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, oh my goodness, we've gone on for, for quite a bit of time right here. I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. I think the one last thing I wanna mention is please be sure to join us next Thursday, same place, same time, we're gonna have same a guest. Zoom link. And next week, we're going to have a special guest, Karen Mojica with Hernando County Mosquito Control is going to be on as a special guest. So I see her listening in today and she's waving her hand there. So Karen's going to be on a little bit. So if you have any really, really hard questions about mosquitoes or mosquito control, go ahead and write them down this week and be ready to share them next week because we want to make sure Karen is still working for for her money here. But Karen's gonna talk a little bit about how we can all do our part to help avoid mosquito problems, uh, what to do if you live in Hernando County and have mosquito problems. And even if you live in another county, who you could contact in your county if you have mosquito questions and problems. So, so tune in next week, special guest, Karen. Lily should be back here again next week to yep. co-host. Yes. Thank you, Lily. Couldn't do it without you. Teresa, definitely couldn't do it without you. Thank you. So, Lily, any yeah. last thoughts? Nope, just stay healthy, everybody. Okay, yeah, stay, stay safe out there, everybody. And thank you very much. See you again next week. Bye.